We may never have to turn back the clocks again, a friend exclaimed while I was out on a bikepacking trip in Moab last week. I didn't believe him at first, but he explained that the U.S. Senate passed the Sunshine Protection Act and that the bill would move on to the House of Representatives for a vote. One of the hardest things for bikepacking in the winter is the early nights. But with the possibility of getting rid of the biannual time change in the United States, this just might make for a more enjoyable experience during those winter months. This Moab trip was somewhat of a launch to the bikepacking season for me. Three days, 175 beautiful and diverse miles between snow-capped mountain ranges through sandstone canyons and with great friends. Joining me on this adventure was photographer Leonardo Brazil, llama guide and musician Chuck Jones, videographer Josh Hicks, and Dave Wilson, who guides for Rim Tours and owns Nuke Sunrise Stitchworks, joined us in Moab for the second half of the trip. I rode this route in 2016 with my partner, but this time I added more miles, more dirt, and basically more unknown terrain, all with the idea that we would still manage a two-night, three-day trip. The route travels through native Ute land, most of which is currently managed by the Bureau of Land Management, which leases much of the land we travel through to livestock grazing and natural gas wells. We set sail on the day, leaving our cars behind and everything we needed to live off our bikes for a few days. One of the biggest question marks of the route was on day one, especially considering the early season conditions and high elevation on the southeastern portion of the route. I was a bit worried about some north facing sections that would hold snow. Despite some slightly damp roads and frost heave, we came out unscathed and more importantly, the roads undamaged. So my seat's not going up all the way, but if I grab up my butt cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> Day was filled with big views as we were surrounded by snow-capped peaks. The Abajos, the San Juans, and of course the LaSalle mountain ranges. The roads lined with sagebrush, and we were even greeted with huge herds of elk. The goal for the day was to get to Black Ridge to camp, which was just southwest of Moab. It would be a 65 mile day and we were on track to get there. But first, a nice resupply in LaSalle, a small town on the south side of the LaSalle mountain range. The downtown consists of a library, post office, and a store that has basically everything you could ask for. After LaSalle, the riding trended downhill, but it was a bit more technical as we meandered our way to Black Ridge. Eventually, we found a great camp spot on the north side of Black Ridge and called it a day. We enjoyed some dinner, reminisced about the day, and slept well that night. All right, so 10 miles to Ken Lake, probably have enough water because it's 25 miles to get to Moab. And then Moab, get lunch, resupply, and then we go up Cane Creek, Hurrah Pass, and then we're in Lockhart Basin. While the weather was absolutely stunning on day one with warm temps and sun, day two had different plans. A storm was approaching, which ushered in some cooler temps and cloud cover. But that didn't stop us from having fun. Bets were even placed on whether or not Josh could do something basically undoable.
But the laughter took a brief pause. After passing Ken's Lake, things got, let's say, a bit challenging. The Steelbender Trail was another stretch I hadn't pedaled before, and for some reason, I did absolutely no research on this section. What do they say? You feel comfortable when you are close to home? That's what I felt about Flat Pass, as its proximity to Moab was so close. This is not easy at all. I, uh, I underestimated it. But boy, did that stretch take a while. While it was absolutely stunning, it certainly had us thinking about bike choice. And Chuck was really the only one that had the proper bike for this stretch. So we picked up Dave Wilson. Dave's got big tires and the right bike for the sand. As for the four of us, we were pretty beat up and we were also salivating at the thought of Milt's, a drive-in burger joint that always hits the spot after a long day in the saddle. We made rather quick time in town as we were somewhat behind schedule. As we were rolling out of town, Dave actually mentioned that there were some petroglyphs nearby, so we'd stop to take a look. We packed a lot of water from Moab, but Dave also coordinated a water drop for us on the southern part of Lockhart Basin, as Rim Tours was going to be hosting a group down there anyways. That being said, this section can definitely be done without a water drop but it's remote, it can be hot, but it was definitely refreshing to see Cane Creek running so well. Heading up. Hurrah Pass. Nice uh, three mile climb. Only 500 feet of climbing. Steady, but it is a little ledgy. Moab can definitely be a zoo during most weekends in the spring and fall. So deciding to go on this trip during the beginning part of the week was a really good idea. And once we got over Hurrah Pass, there was a whole lot of peace and quiet, and even a little bit of rain. After meandering along the Colorado River a bit, we hit a junction of Chicken Corners and Lockhart Basin. From my memory, the next stretch was pretty challenging, and I was right. It was super technical, but not nearly as tough as Flat Pass. I'm hiking the Hey Duke. Uh, I got yeah. Oh, we were just talking about the Hey Duke. Yeah. It was only like my third day on the trail. How are you feeling? It's tough. It, it's like the terrain is a lot flatter. Yeah. But man, it's so mentally yeah. like tiring. Yeah. It's like, where am I going? And exactly, it's just constant navigation and like, gotta always be worried about water out here. Yeah, totally. But it's so stunning. Yeah. Like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. How far are you guys going? We're trying to just get to the end of this little mesa here and camp for the night, so. All right. Yeah. We only managed 51 miles on the day, but they were well-earned miles. We found a good protected camp spot for the night and enjoyed it. That's a view. We woke up to the sun-glazed canyon walls, a sight that never gets old. It was a brisk morning, with a stiff wind from the north. But lucky for us, we were headed south all day. Just left camp for the day. Just hit the sun for the first time. It's kind of a windy night, so we had to be protected, and um, we didn't uh, we didn't camp where the sun was in the morning. But now we're in it. Gorgeous day, a whole lot of this. We saw Sean of the trail again that morning, and I gave him a liter of water as I had plenty, and I also knew that we had a water drop maybe 10 miles ahead. 
I must say, solo adventures are not easy, but a solo hike on the Hayduke Trail, well, that's super badass. We had 55 miles back to the vehicle and what I believe is the best section of the route. This stretch reminds me of the White Rim a little bit. The trail took us next to steep 1,000 foot sandstone walls, making us feel pretty insignificant. We steadily climbed throughout the day until we hit a downhill into Lockhart Basin. We stopped to grab water at our water drop and enjoyed some last bits of solitude as we would soon be back with the Jeepers, RVs, and pavement. And while Highway 211 is busy with cars, most of the drivers are pretty respectful. And there was a certain contrast that the newly paved road had with the orange walls. As we climbed out of Canyon Creek, we could just feel the temperature starting to drop. We stopped once more along the way to check out more native petroglyphs at Newspaper Rock before finally finishing the climb to our vehicles. Overall, the trip was a success, and our day is much more enjoyable with that daylight savings mode yeah. switched on. We slept in, pedaled later into the day, and had an absolute blast in between. 